following is a broadcast of North Burlington Baptist Church. Um, I have to say, too, I have this little internal conflict going on inside of me. Uh, I love being here with all of you. I love celebrating the reason for the season. But in my house, in my basement, is a tree. And beneath that tree are boxes that are still wrapped. You know where I'm going with this, don't you? So today's sermon may be a little shorter. I said maybe. I said maybe, okay? Uh, But (laughs) I know I'm not alone. Everybody's going, yes. I've already had death threats, okay? Anything over 20 minutes, you're so... uh, But I still hope I can give you something to reflect on. Now, I know that today we have no child care, so we have something special for all the kids. Anybody who's 20 or younger, stand up. Okay, so let's say we got, okay, we got 20, let's say 25 and younger. Okay, all right, that's good. All right, so here are some, it says bingo. It's not really bingo because we don't play bingo in shirts. This is a Christmas... This is your Christmas card, okay? And you, uh, your hand if you want those out. Okay, you'll hand them. So what you need to do, there's certain words on there. Cross them out as I say them, okay? So you actually have to pay attention. If your card gets full, just stand up and yell, Merry Christmas! And I have a tub full of chocolates here, okay? And uh, all of a sudden, everybody's age has suddenly dropped, Okay? So you just, just don't feel like you're disturbing. Is that okay with everybody? Everybody's in the kind of Christmas cheer, right? We don't mind if people stand up yelling Merry Christmas because the Spirit moves them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, that's not right, Wendy. Okay. So I know this is the week before New Year, and uh, for most of you, at least for me, we'll be doing a little more reflection. Uh, I think people uh, this time kind of look over the past year uh, and, um, you know, the news stations will be doing their uh, end of the year review. The top stories, major headlines will be revealed. And I don't know if you do that personally, but I, I tend to go back over the last year and, and think about what took place. And by and large, in many ways, it's pretty much, you know, the same events, just different names, isn't it? And uh, as you think about it, most of our time spent this year was just kind of routine. Uh, we don't really go back over the last year and think, oh yeah, this was the year I read some books. I mean, reading books is just, you know, ordinary, everyday, normal. But it's not really, you know. Uh, Did you know that for the majority of people who lived on this planet, formal education was never an option? I'm not suggesting that education wasn't offered, but it wasn't made public like it is today. Um... It wasn't for everybody. It wasn't until Christians who wanted to educate the masses so that they could uh, read the Bible and understand more of God and his creation that education began to be made public. Um, Education for the masses took place uh, from the rise of Christianity. And it was Christians who were first to teach both males and females in the same setting. The Romans taught... um, boys, but only those boys from the privileged class. So radical was this concept of teaching both males and females together that uh, one student uh, was uh, prompted to proclaim that Christians taught everybody, including girls and women. Imagine. The tax-supported schools, uh, which we now enjoy, was first thought of by the Christian Protestant reformer Martin Luther, who believed that children should be compelled to go to school. Prior to this, education was primarily run through the churches. And it was a Lutheran layman, Johann Sturm, who first imagined a a school system with graded education um, that he felt would motivate students to study because they would be rewarded by advancing to the next level. In fact, wherever you look at education taking place, you can probably trace it back to the influence of Christians committed to teaching about God. Kindergarten, Education for the deaf, education for the blind, even universities and higher education all trace their roots back to Christianity. 
So we look back over this year and we don't say, this year I read a book because there's nothing special about it. Everyone can do that. But that's only because you were born after Christ. And his influence began to penetrate our world. Public education was the fruit of Christ's influence. Well, a couple of weeks ago, we started a series called The Hinge of History. And I, we took the title from a quote by a, a, a radio preacher famous in the early 1900s, Ralph W. Stockman, who said, The hinge of history is on the door of a Bethlehem stable. The point being made was that the influence of Jesus Christ upon the world by his followers uh, as they sought to live out his radical claims for them and the implications of... Merry Christmas already! (laughs) Come on up here. Wow. How many many gifts did the wise men bring? Three Three it is. There you go. And you, you don't have to share those. It is Christmas, but there's a little Grinch in all of us, isn't there? Okay. I forgot where I was, so I was going to repeat myself. Yeah, yeah, let's start. (laughs) She'll just say Merry Christmas again. I know how this works. So the point being made is the influence of Jesus Christ upon the world and his followers as they lived out these radical implications uh, and followed his selfless and humble example, made profound impact on our world. Uh, so much so that modern calendars are dated by his life. So two weeks ago, we looked at life B.C., before Christ. Today, as we remember and celebrate the coming of Jesus into the world, we are looking at life A.D., after Christ came and his uh, teaching began to impact and his life began to penetrate our world. And it seems that the tendency lately has been to... Uh, to ignore the contribution that Jesus made on life on this planet, to stress uh, perhaps the negative aspects of church history. It seems that it's fashionable to characterize the Christian faith as authoritarian and repressive, a faith that promotes fanaticism while uh, impeding science and free inquiry. Um, So over the course of this series, I'm attempting to just paint a different kind of picture for you. And while it's true that all philosophies and religions and practices uh, have had their abuses by those who claim their belief, um, they're acting contrary to those belief claims very often. So I think the balance is tilted in favor of the good uh, when one weighs the influence that Christ has brought into the world. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we looked at how much worse it would be and has, has been prior to the life of Christ. Um, And today, I want us to consider what the world is like now after Christ. And I want us to personally consider what impact he's had on you in this past year. You know, each year, I try to journal um, what takes place. Hey, Merry Christmas. How... How many, uh, how many turtle doves were there? How many? Two. Two? Okay, well, I'm going to give you three because I forgot. Yeah. How tall are you? Uh, Divide that by two. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> <One more. laughs> I didn't exactly plan this as well as I thought I did, I don't think. Oh, dear. So I try to keep a journal each year. I don't always succeed. And then I go back in the new year, at the end of the year, and just look it over. And I got to tell you, it kind of reads like a medical report, you know. Uh, one of the kids got a cold, you know. Uh, one of the kids had a concussion. One of the kids got bit by a dog and needed rabies shots. This is all this year, by the way. I needed to have a, a, a filling in my tooth. And, uh, you know, it's just kind of ordinary stuff, nothing earth-shaking, nothing amazing, But that's because it's after Christ. And we have the influence of Christ on modern medicine. Hospitals, health cares, they all find their roots in Christianity. Come on up. Oh, yeah, well, it's not my fault if it lasts longer. Did you get 2012? No, I missed that one, but I 
When it said full, it has to be a full box. A full box. She's cheating. Has it a full box for you? Who put that in there? Well, this is a scam. All right, we'll give it to you. It meant to be a full box. Ah, oh, all right. I should have checked. All right. That's okay. We'll keep giving. Um, it's just, that's how it is on Christmas. You keep giving. Even after Christmas, you're still giving. Okay. Um, and, and, uh, and that's because the, the medical profession uh, find their roots in Christianity. And it was those who followed the example of Jesus who went around healing and, uh, and, and taking care of the sick that they were motivated to try and help others and, and they created healthcare systems as we know it. Uh, the first hospital that cared for the sick was built in AD 369 by St. Basil. And the advances made to the medical care by Christians can hardly be uh, underestimated. Care for the mentally ill was first formed by who? Christians, who saw how these people were treated like animals and sought a more humane care. Um, Nursing and the Red Cross, both founded by Christians. In fact, the Red Crescent uh, was founded after uh, the Muslims in Turkey recognized the Red Cross's contributions. So the Red Crescent owes its influence to Christianity. The discovery of penicillin, penicillin, which has saved hundreds of thousands of lives. The discovery of ether to put people to sleep while being operated on. Can you imagine being operated on without anything? Uh, it used to be. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'll tell you one thing though, this is keeping them paying attention <laughs> until they get the chocolates. And, uh, and, and uh, it was both ether and penicillin that was found by the discoveries of Christians trying to alleviate pain and suffering. Um, and I think that many in the West take for granted uh, the many positive contributions that Christianity made in our culture. And they assumed that these discoveries would have been made with or without people uh, being uh, committed Christians or not. However, the reality is that their Christianity was not an aside to their discoveries. It was central to and predicated upon their Christian beliefs. It what, it's what motivated them and urged them to move forward. Uh, one area where this is clearly seen is in the development of modern science. Uh, there is a character of Christianity that suggests that um, that Christianity is anti-science. That uh, there are, and, and there are people who claim the name of Christian who have this anti-science attitude. But not everything a person who claims to be a Christian uh, does necessarily reflects the teachings of that particular belief. In other words, their scientific positions are not necessarily representative of the Christian faith. And it seems clear that the development of science was pioneered by those who followed the teachings of Jesus. Now, I did not do well in science. In fact, um, I got asked by my chemistry teacher that if I tried to answer every question on my final exam, and he said, don't write any jokes, <laughs> he would give me a 50 to pass, but I had to promise never to take chemistry again. <laughs> so... I want to play a clip for you from uh, John Lennox, who's a professor of mathematics at the University of Oxford. Uh, he's a fellow in mathematics and the philosophy of science uh, and pastoral advisor at Green Templeton College in Oxford. Have a look at this. But let's get down to, to this question about the very common notion that science has made religion obsolete. I find it almost ironical that it's actually <clears throat> a very false notion to history. I, I think it's worth concentrating for sake of compression of time and argument on the fact that modern science as we know it exploded in the, in the 16th and 17th centuries in, in Western Europe. And historians and philosophers of science have constantly asked the question, why did it happen there and why did it happen then? And I've given a great deal of thought to this and work with colleagues at Oxford who've contributed seminal works to it, but the general consensus appears to be, and I put it in the words of C.S. Lewis, summing up the work of Alfred North Whitehead on the topic, when he said, men became scientific because they expected law in nature, and they expected law in nature because they believed in a lawgiver. In other words, 
If we think of Galileo, Kepler, Newton, Clark, Maxwell and so on, what drove their science was the belief that science could be done. Now why did they believe it could be done? Because they believed that the universe was rationally intelligible, at least in part. And why did they believe that? Because they believed there was a creative mind behind it. So it seems to me that the history of science is on the side of those that think that there is no um, conflict essentially between them. So that's where I'd start on that one. Did you catch that? What, what drove scientific discovery and inquiry was a belief that there is logic behind the universe because it was created by God. Uh, I don't know if you read uh, Time Magazine's uh, Person of the Year, uh, but this year it was a protester. And it seems that uh, people movements have asserted themselves in many regions. Uh, Egypt, Syria, Tunisia, Libya, Yemen, Morocco, just to name a few. That's not one place, that was a whole bunch of places. I just said it fast. And uh, there's an assumption, a philosophy, a belief that undergirds all these protests. And it's a belief that's not always existed. It's a belief that individuals are equal. That there should be representation in the political square. That no one individual is exempt from the rule of law. And these ideas have not always been prevalent. Uh, the pagans of history are full of accounts where the ruler is exempt from being accountable to law and where they were accountable to nobody. In ancient Greco-Roman world, the rights of the individual were always subordinate to the state. In Hitler's Germany, he said, uh, the individual is nothing. The group, by which he meant the Nazi party, is everything. But it was the teachings of the Bible that leveled the playing field and became the basis for criminal and civil justice in the Western world, to which many are now looking. <coughs> the Magna Carta of 1215 boldly set forth rights that had never been granted before. Let me read some of them to you. Justice could no longer be sold or denied to freemen who were under the authority of barons. No taxes could be levied without representation. No one could be imprisoned without a trial. Property could not be taken from the owner without just compensation. Radical new beliefs of justice. And the Magna Carta, in its preamble, states that the charter was formulated out of reverence for God and for the salvation of our soul and those of all our ancestors and heirs, for the honor of God and the exaltation of the Holy Church and the reform of our realm on the advice of our rev reverenced church fathers. See, at a time when the individual was subordinate to the state, Jesus and his teaching exalted the place of the individual. It was a belief that God calls each person to make a decision to decide about that gift of his son who died for them. And that at once imputed to humans a sense of dignity and worth and value because they were valued so much that God would humble himself for them. At the same time, it brought tremendous responsibility and very serious personal accountability since they alone must decide what their standing before God will be. They will have to make the call. They are individually responsible. Merry Christmas. Come on up, sweetie. How tall are you? I think you're four feet. <laughs> she has a sister. <clears throat> the American educator and European historian, uh, Carlton Joseph Huxley Hayes, says this, uh, Wherever Christian ideas have been generally accepted and their practice sincerely attempted... There is a dynamic liberty. And wherever Christianity has been ignored or rejected, persecuted or chained to the state, there is tyranny. Let me ask you a question. Did any of you read a book this past year? Did you perhaps use some math or some other skill you learned in school? Do you take that for granted? How about the use of medicine or hospitals or professional doctors and nurses? Did any of you require their help this year? 
Have you enjoyed any benefits of modern science that's brought to your life? Computers, clocks, cars? Who do you think for motivating those who first discovered the scientific principles that allowed for such inventions from which your life is so blessed because of? Did you write your MP or uh, make your views known to your city councillor? Did you vote? Or let me ask you another way. How often last year did you lose sleep because you thought someone might come and take your house and kick you out? Did you ever worry that you'd be accused of some crime and hung or imprisoned without a trial? Who do you think, for all the blessings that you're on the receiving end of, I think you have to thank the influence of this child whose birth we celebrate today. It was the influence of Jesus from which these and many other benefits, are now, which we now take for granted, were derived from. I find it interesting how um, there are times in history when famous people uh, with different philosophies die at the same time. I don't know if you've noticed this or not. Uh, and I've wondered what kind of discussions they might have in the afterlife um, once now they find out reality and they discuss from their different philosophical bents uh, as they're challenged by their new realities. For instance, on the day that JFK was shot, C.S. Lewis uh, who was a brilliant literary scholar, also died, as well as Aldous Huxley. And uh, these men were very successful and committed to radically different worldviews. Kennedy was a Roman Catholic but by name, but was a humanist by practice. C.S. Lewis was a practicing uh, Christian, and Huxley was a pantheist. In his book, uh, uh, Between Heaven and Hell, a dialogue between beyond death with John F. Kennedy, C.S. Lewis, and Aldous Huxley, uh, author Peter Kreeft, uh, has an imaginary discussion that takes place between these three men after they've died. You ever think about those things? I find it interesting too that on uh, August 31st, 1997, both Princess Diana and Mother Teresa died. One who lived in riches, the other who lived in poverty, but both who contributed to the needs of the poor. This past week, there were a couple of people who died I find very interesting. On December 15th, the outspoken and militant atheist Christopher Hitchens died. And on December 18th, the eccentric leader of North Korea, Kim Jong-il, died. One man taught that there was no God and that all religion was done, uh, has, has been done has brought poison on society. In his own words, organized religion is violent, irrational, intolerant, allied to racism, tribalism, and bigotry, invested in ignorance, and hostile to free inquiry, contemptuous of women, and coercive towards children. The other taught that he was God. And according to his official biography, Kim, Kim Jong-il uh, was born in a secret log cabin in North Korea's Mount Paektu in February of 1942. And his birth was prophesied by a swallow and heralded by the appearance of a double rainbow and a new star in the sky. Obviously, they both can't be right. What do you think about God? You know, prior to the birth of Christ, the instinctive reaction to God or God's was dominated by fear. One who is so great that he couldn't be approached. One who should be placated. One who is beyond understanding and certainly not one to whom you could draw near to. But Jesus gave a better understanding of the nature of God. He said God is love. He said that he's merciful and that God is for us and not against us. So much is God for us that he came as one of us to pay the cost of our rebellion against him providing an opportunity for us to call God friend. Tell me, friends, this year, what's been your perception of God? Could it be that you're closer to being a believer in the teachings of Christ and the ways of Christ than you assumed? And maybe, as we end this year, we should thank Him for all that He's done. And we could maybe commit to becoming to know more of Him in 2012. Let's pray. So Lord Jesus, uh, because too often we take for granted all the blessings that really are been given from you, from your life and example and teaching, uh, and we just want to give you thanks this day. Thank you for giving us these things and then being so humble that you don't even require of us to give you thanks, but you provide the opportunity where we have the privilege that we can, and so we thank you. We thank you for how you healed the sick, how you, how you educated the masses, how you gave each individual a value and a worth, and how you taught as the true nature of a God who loves us. 
And may we in this year come to know more of you. For we ask it in your name. Amen. Did they need to get a bangle? Or a Christmas card? <laughs> or two words? Anybody still missing words? What, what, you got one already. What word are you missing? <laughs> anybody, did, anybody, did anybody have a Christmas card that didn't get chocolate because they were too scared to shout Merry Christmas? <laughs> Just come on, stand up and shout Merry Christmas right now. Gord, stand up. Let's go. Come on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, my own son. <laughs> Anybody else? Murder. Oh, over there? Okay, yeah. Oh, oh, we got some more. Okay, hold on. There you go. There you go, sweetie. Whoop. Oh, she's coming to get some. Yeah, thank you. Merry Christmas to you. You get four for being so nice. Oh, we got some more back there. Oh, what? What? Oh. She, there you go, sweetie. <laughs> Hold on. Oh, yeah. There you go. There you go. There you go, sweetheart. Merry Christmas to you. Here we go. Sonia, no. Oh, oh yeah, no. For, yeah, for being so late. Stand up and say Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. There we go. Now, now, didn't you appreciate the band coming in today? Yeah. So, don't they deserve a little? Yeah. Oh, there you go. Thanks, man. There you go. There you go. Awesome. Now, I take another one. <laughs> Thank you. We weren't counting. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. There you go. Well, one's stuck together. You get two. You know, the great things about that, it's like a gift. But you know what you wouldn't do with this? You would just put it in your mouth. It has to be unwrapped. Mm -hmm. Then you have to taste and see how good it is. See, that's how gifts are sometimes. They're given to you, but it has to be received. And then when it comes to you, sometimes it's wrapped. Sometimes it's swaddling clothes. Sometimes it's wrapped in humanity. You may not recognize it for what it is. But then you begin to unwrap it, and you see, hey, it's good. It's very good. And if you taste it, you'll see. You see how that works? I know others are saying, well, I didn't come down my row. I'm coming. <laughs> You're more interested... Gord, you've been all day. You've been very good. Merry Christmas. I don't want no fighting in the house, okay? All right. Okay, I got one left. One left. Oh, there's somebody. Somebody who wants the gift. Somebody who wants the gift. You know, sometimes all you got to do is ask and you receive. Sorry. Do you get the point, friends? This Christmas is a gift offered to you. Don't just look past it. Maybe this year you want to receive and open and unwrap the gift and taste and see that it's good. God came to earth because he loves you. That's the whole story of Christmas. And he longs to be in relationship with you and he longs for you to understand him better. That's why Christians throughout the ages have done all that we've done in order to communicate this fact. So we've educated, and we've brought healing in his name, we've taught the worth of the individual. This time, friends, don't go from this place saying, what's Christ got to do with Christmas? Recognize that Christ not only has to do with Christmas, but your everyday existence, the way it is, you owe to him. Go in the grace and peace of God. podcast is a service of North Burlington Baptist Church. If you have any questions or comments, you can email us at info at nbbc.ca. You can also find more information about us at www.nbbc.ca.